So DIG's new recommendation features are all about finding people who like the kind of news that you like, but isn't there a danger there of, of groupthink, of people only reading the news that, well, they happen to agree with already? Yeah, well, we always want to keep that overall global zeitgeist view, and that is the view that it's, you're looking globally at what people think is really interesting and cool. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we can service those niche interests so that if there's something like Alex said, like he likes ducks, ducks uh, we can deliver that Very content specific, to the personal. people who want to see it. I don't know how many duck stories we have coming in to dig every day. You'd be but. surprised, I track it. <laughs>what was the BBC Micro? Yeah. Well, uh, for a lot of people, it was how they got into programming, originally. Um, it was in a lot of schools, it was in a lot of homes, um, not as many homes as some other machines, but for a lot of people it was their introduction to programming and computing in general. But what I found out is that if you look at what the BBC Micro was, over time, it was an education programme. And actually it came out of adult literacy programmes, and it was the idea of introducing computer literacy to the British public as a whole. By the mid 80s, I think 86 or so forth, um, I think every primary school in the UK had been given one by the Department of Education. So that's a lot, that's about 25,000 schools. And um, the evidence, uh, by this time I'm working in BBC Education, remember. Uh, you know, the evidence seemed to be that, okay, they'd got the micro, but it was still in the cardboard box. So the question is, what could we do, BBC Education, schools department, uh, although I might work mainly for adults, I got, uh, did this for schools, you know, could I come up with a short TV series that would encourage the teachers to kind of open the box and get the thing out? So my connection with micro was really, uh, you know, a personal one uh, on the one hand, uh, and a sort of now, I suppose, a kind of promotional thing. Here's this amazing thing you've got. And if you only open the box, the kids will love it, which, of course, <laughs> is exactly... The kids did love it, so how effective the programmes were in getting the kids to open the box. They were miniature programmes, uh, five-part series, I think there were five, where each programme showed the micro being used for something interesting or wacky that the kids would just desperately want to do, and they by sort of, as it were, blackmail the teacher into opening the box. When you see the laptops in use, what, what kind of transformation, what kind of uh, result, what, what results from that? Well, there are three transformations that stick out in everybody's mind, and when you go, and this is anywhere. Um, the first is if you go into a classroom that has this, the energy in that classroom is like nothing you've seen before. Um, the second thing you see is you, you, you see families uh, benefiting. Lots of parents tell us that uh, they can't wait for the child to go to sleep because as soon as the child's asleep, they take the laptop and use it. Um, you see a lot of, of, of children teaching parents, children teaching grandparents. And then the third, which is, which is perhaps more general and, and, and exclusive, is that the role of children in society changes. Uh, and, and they see it themselves, their own self-esteem. And it's analogous in the developed world, perhaps, to the way a parent feels about their child today, because they're dependent on the child to show them how to use their cell phone and how to use their laptop. And that doesn't destroy the parent-child relationship. In fact, it kind of makes it better.